All right, so good evening and thank you so much for joining us tonight and taking an hour out of your evening. Um, I know most of you, but I'm Michelle. <laughs> so um, tonight we are going to be discussing our Healthy Seas program, um, the area and the projects with Level Pratt. After a brief um, intro by Level, we'll start the Q&A. Um, you will, may or may not be muted. You can raise your virtual hand to ask questions or with a small number, you can kind of wave at me and I'll catch you in the screen. Um, you can also, if you have a multi-part question, you can type it into the chat box and I'll make sure to, to read that off and facilitate that with Level. Now we're trying something a little bit new. I'm gonna share my screen with you real quick. And we're checking out a new platform, new for us anyways. Um, it is text to give. And if you text the word friends to the phone number you see on your screen, you can make a easy donation to friends for this work, or you can go online to donate at sanjuans.org. Um, tonight we have a $500 match, so if you donate during this week anytime, um, we, they will have a donor who will match that $500. Okay, so as I get ready to turn this over to Lovell, um, I just want to give a little background. Lovell Pratt is our Marine Protection and Policy Director. And as wide as our topic is and our program for Healthy Seas, that is so seriously matched by Level's depth of knowledge and her passion for protecting the Salish Sea and the Southern resident Orca. Um, I have the great honor to work with Level and she is this amazing walking resource of so much information. I, I probably drive her nuts asking questions, but she's always got the answer and it's always spot on, accurate, current, and it's just, it's really such a great opportunity to work with you, Level, and I will let you take it from here. Wow, thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm really glad to be here tonight with all of you, so thanks, thank you for coming. Um, you know, I'll just give a brief introduction and then I really look forward to hearing your questions and just having a conversation about the work that we're doing at Friends. You know, it all starts with our mission to protect and restore the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea for people in nature. And so the Healthy Seas program where I focus my work is all about protecting and restoring the Salish Sea. And Michelle, maybe I'll just ask you to put up that first slide because I think it's just really great to get ourselves oriented in terms of the geography of the place where we live. And um, no, let's see. Right. That's okay. So um, the Sailor Sea is a huge inland sea. And I love the way that it's defined to also include the watershed surrounding it. Um, and so the work that I do, obviously, it can't um, deal with everything that's going on. Uh, that's impacting the marine waters of the Salish Sea. Um, so a lot of the work is, um, but a, a lot of the work that I do is transboundary. So I have colleagues in Canada that I work with and um, work with staff from tribes and First Nations and work with um, different staff from local and regional and even federal governments on both sides of the border uh, working to protect and recover the Salish Sea. Um, Level, I'm so sorry for some reason that PowerPoint is not coming up, but if you bear with me and- Oh, that's fine. Whenever it comes up is fine. We'll get to it. Um, so, uh, and just a lot of the work that I do is opportunistic. So if there's a permit that is being proposed and there's an opportunity for engagement, obviously that's something that I'll, I'll work on <clears throat> to try to get the best possible outcome. Um, if there's an opportunity to submit comments on a review of, of something, um, you know, at the state or federal level, that's definitely something I'll take advantage of. Um, but the other, um, I've also tried to be proactive. Okay, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, so um, this is our transboundary inland Salish Sea. 
Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, Michelle, we'll just zoom in a little closer in the central part of the Salish Sea. I always think of the San Juan Islands as the heart of the Salish Sea. So there we are right at the center. And um, I, you know, the San Juan Islands has the majority of our square miles are the marine waters. And so, you know, they include parts of Boundary Pass and Harrow Strait to the west. Rosario Strait to the east, the Strait of Juan de Fuca to the south, and Lower Georgia Strait to the north. Um, so this is a good map just to get us oriented. And while this um, map that I have here is this beautiful um, view of the land and sea, you also have to imagine that these are major shipping lanes. Um, and the Port of Vancouver in Canada is the biggest port in all of Canada. And so there's a lot of traffic that goes up Harrow Strait and Boundary Pass to and from Canada. Um, so um, I, think, uh, I think I'll just leave it at that and we can go ahead and start questions if, if anybody has any and... Hmm, let's see. Well, I have a, a text question in for you level from someone who was supposed to attend. And it says, uh, can you update us about efforts, uh, for example, task force status updates, plans or initiative to help ensure the sustainability of the southern resident killer whales? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, back in uh, 2001, Friends of the San Juans was one of the organizations that was a co-petitioner to have the southern resident killer whales listed under the Endangered Species Act. And that finally took place in 2005. And ever since then, the recovery and protection of Southern resident orcas has been a high priority for the organization. And, and that continues to this day. Um, one of the areas that I spend a lot of time on right now, um, uh, which is a recommendation that came out of the, the governor's Southern resident orca task force is implementing a, it's a rulemaking to establish a licensing program for commercial whale watchers. And um, I'm on the advisory committee. And so that's taken up a lot of time attending the meetings and participating in that. And um, it's been a difficult process. Um, I don't think we're going to reach consensus. Uh, and um, the staff will be, um, there was a group that put forward one proposal from the environmental community and retired scientists that I worked on, and another proposal from the representatives from the Pacific Whale Watch Association. And both proposals were um, reviewed and commented on by a science panel. And then the staff at Department of Fish and Wildlife will submit a recommendation to their commissioners, and they'll finalize the rulemaking in December. Um, so the goal of this, uh, this rulemaking and, and several others is to try to reduce the impacts of vessel noise and presence on the Southern residents. Um, the Southern residents rely on their ability to echolocate, you know, just like bats to find their prey. And because there's so few salmon out there, um, uh, it really makes a difference in terms of their ability to catch the scarce prey. Uh, the impacts from vessel noise and presence. Um, <clears throat> so that's one um, recommendation that's moving forward. But clearly, uh, I don't know if you all have noticed, but it seems like because of COVID, everybody's decided that the best way to vacation is in a boat. And everywhere I go, where typically you'll have a few boats more during the summer, it's just chock full of boats. And, um, and I think some of these boaters are new to boating and probably shouldn't be boating <laughs> without having some good lessons. Oh, no. Yeah. That's definitely, I think, a challenge we're facing right now. And I think that, mm. um, I think that that's been difficult for the whales. There's been some documentation of harassment of whales by boaters and jet skiers mm. in the summer that's really unfortunate. Uh, and I think a lot of oh. people not knowing the regulations, not knowing any better. Um, but it's really a problem. So clearly, um, more needs to be done to deal with the impacts from recreational boats as well as uh, commercial whale watch boats um, that, that do, for the most part, um, 
do try to follow the rules and, and do a good job at that. Um, so um, other things that are moving forward. Love, you, I'm sorry, can I interrupt for a moment? I saw Glenn's yeah. hand go up and it might be relevant. Oh, yeah, it's, no, it's on. Oh, well, I, I guess, Love, I, you know, I mean, since you're talking about the governor's task force, I mean, it seems like there were quite a few things that were kind of left on the table. Um, and I guess I'm wondering what has happened since that time frame? Are the participating groups trying to get together and reformulate or, I mean, is there a plan behind that? Yeah, so one thing that's been held up, one of the outcomes of the, of the task force was to establish a position in the governor's office that was gonna coordinate all these efforts. And the hiring for that position has been delayed because of COVID. So that's a, that's a real unfortunate delay there. But there is still um, there is there is are still steps moving forward. So, for example, there was a recommendation that um, in Canada they have a program called Echo Enhanced Cetacean Habitat and Observation, and it's a group that's had good success with large commercial ships, getting them to slow down and avoid um, foraging hotspots for the killer whales. And they've had very good participation on a voluntary basis from the majority of the commercial ships that transit the waters. So one goal was to try to establish a program like that in Washington state. And that is moving forward through the uh, Northwest Seaport Alliance. And so it hasn't been established yet, but it's, it's making its way forward. Canada got a real head start on us with their program. Um, so we have some catching up to do here, but it looks like that's moving forward. So that's- I have, I have noticed that, you know, the container ships are moving a lot slower. Yes, yes. Yeah, they get $500 if they slow down. Is that the number as I remember? Yeah, they have some incentive. It's an incentive program that reduces their cost for, for mooring in, in the Port of Vancouver if they comply with the with the vessel slow down. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So um, yeah. another area that is <coughs> interesting, I don't know if you recall, there was a cook aquaculture had some uh, fin fish, some salmon net pens, yeah. and there was one near Cypress Island that collapsed. And it was just this horrific event. The, the net pen collapsed. There was an escape of all the Atlantic salmon that were there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, um, and as a result of that, there was a, a lawsuit by the Wild Fish Conservancy. And that lawsuit was settled. And the funding from that settlement has gone to the Rose Foundation. And they've set up a, um, a program for grants to help with um, protecting and recovering southern resident killer whales and improving water quality and the habitat for their wild fish food web which is great. So that's gonna help continue some of the implementation of the task force recommendations. Because I think that um, with the current economy, there was some one-time funding or there was significant one-time funding um, through the state, but it's, it, it's questionable whether that can be continued um, it, you know, as they go forward with the state budget just at this time when the economy is doing so poorly. Um, so there is there is some other m funds being leveraged to help move forward with the task force recommendations, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, but I, I'm sure you've heard that three of the southern residents are pregnant, which is great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Taliqua, Taliqua, the one who carried her baby around for 17 days. Yeah. <laughs> but but they're not optimistic. <laughs> they're not optimistic about her carrying to term. Yeah, I know it's real. It's a real challenge. Yeah. Um, All right. So other other questions we have or? other questions. I have others in print, but I want to give time to those of you here. Mm. So, um, Brent. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the other organizations that are um, kind of like the major players in these conversations, and kind of like what are the roles of the different organizations um, in relation to each other and kind of where does friends fit in with that? So it, are you curious about in terms of orca protection and recovery in particular, or just the yeah, broader? Sure. Yeah, we can start with that. Okay. You bet. 
So um, there is a coalition called the Orca Salmon Alliance, and um, there's about 20 some groups who participate in that coalition. And it's focused both on uh, protection and recovery of the orca, but also the Chinook salmon, which is the preferred prey of the orca. So they're looking at the whole food web issues as well. And um, there was a recent um, letter that was um, spearheaded by some members of that group that went to the um, NOAA um, in regard to a proposal from the Navy to do training and testing, which would result in what is called a take, which means they recognize that there would be harm done to the orca in the course of their training and testing. And they wanted to be able to, you know, move forward with their training and testing in spite of the fact that this would be harmful to the Southern residents. 52 was it? What was the number? Uh, yeah, 52 takes a year. Yeah. And that's, you know, that can result in anything from a minor injury to an injury that results in death. So it's not incidental, um, but it's not as if 52 orcas could die every year, which would of course decimate the population. Um, so um, that, that group was very active in responding uh, to that. And then also there's been a proposal for a new dam um, on the Chehalis and so that group has been very active to oppose that, the construction of a new dam, because of course that's a, a, a Chinook bearing uh, river system. And so it's important to the, to the orca that that salmon um, be able to continue to produce there and not be interrupted by a dam. And that group is very active, um, trying to get the Snake River dams removed and um, very active in that process. So, that those are, um, that's a river system that contributes to the orca that when they feed off the mouth of the Columbia River, many of those Chinook salmon come from the Snake River. So, so there's a good example. The, okay, so the, the Corps of Engineers said, no, nope, we're not taking them down. So what do you do next? Well, we just um, collaborated on a letter to the governors, the four governors in Oregon and Washington asking them to um, apply their leadership to try to um, address this separately from the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we'll see <laughs> how that proceeds. Yeah, but that's, that's the next step. Yeah. So, and I think, um, so I'll, I'll, and I'll just share, I've, I've worked quite a bit most recently with uh, Nora Nickham who works for the Seattle Aquarium, and with Michael Jasney, who works with NRDC, and with Rain Adaman at the Washington Environmental Council. And uh, the four of us have been a team, <laughs> along with Joe Scordino, who's a retired scientist, um, on this uh, advisory committee for the Commercial Whale Watch Licensing Program. And I've uh, really enjoyed that collaboration with with um, all of them. That's been great. So how about Cherry Point and uh, everything that's going on over there? Yeah, so, um, so Cherry Point uh, in Whatcom County, uh, it's actually an aquatic reserve and I'm, I'm on the, the um, Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Implementation Committee. And so um, there are three major industrial facilities there that lease their docks from the Department of Natural Resources. So there's two refineries, BP and Phillips 66, and then there's um, Petrogas, which is a liquid petroleum gas export facility. And um, one of the things I'm really working on there, and this is one of those situations where I'm on this committee, but I'm proactively trying to improve the situation there. Um, if you're moving cargo in a ship, you're required to be insured at a certain level to prove that you can respond to an oil spill of a certain value. Um, if you're a refinery facility, there is, you don't have to prove financial ability to- Wow. Um, you know, cover the cost of recovering the environment that's damaged um, dealing with the spill. 
Um, so you don't have to show proof of insurance or other, another form of proof of financial responsibility. So through the management plan at Cherry Point, I'm trying to make that part of their um, lease requirements because right now they do in their lease requirements, it's kind of ironic. They have this requirement that they have to show uh, financial ability to repair any damage to the dock itself, but they don't have to show any financial ability to restore the environment outside of the, the physical oh. footprint of the dock if there's no. damage from a spill or, or other, other form of environmental damage. So, and that's, that seems to be moving forward. I'm really hopeful. Ecology actually has, um, <clears throat> they have the legislative authority to implement um, a requirement for refineries to prove financial ability to respond to damages from a spill, but they just haven't had the resources to implement that yet. So I keep nagging them, but I'm, I'm trying this other route through DNR and it seems to be moving forward. We have a great commissioner of public lands. She's very proactive, Hillary France, and she's, and she's yeah. very, um, yeah, she's, she's very proactive and really responsive to environmental concerns, which is great. Did you see the, uh, the oil spill up in Mauritius? Oh, tragic. So tragic. Yeah, I mean, there are no <laughs> legal ramifications for them to repair oh. or anything. Oh. And they, they don't have the money. So, you know, if you can get something like that, you know, to make them, well, it sounds like make them responsible, but at least, you know, have the insurance available in case there is some kind of natural disaster. I, I think it's also really important too, because then it puts the, whether it's a, a you know, a vessel or a, a facility, it, it just puts them on notice that they have a fiduciary obligation and that they they just can't I mean they have to really pay attention to that and I think for the most part um, you know we're fortunate that Washington State our our requirements at the state level for oil spill prevention and oil spill response resources is greater than what the federal government requires and of course a lot of the regulations we have at the federal level were a result of the Exxon Valdez spill so 30 years ago, the Oil Spill um, Pollution Act, Open 90, was established. And, um, and that was all as a result of the Exxon Valdez. So it's tragic when you have to have perfect catastrophes uh, to motivate you know, positive change that can yeah. improve prevention and response resources. Um, Tesoro, I guess lessons learned i mean you snatch victory from the jaws of defeat i mean what what did you learn from that and what can you do to apply that to other things like cherry point as an example yeah so um so this was a collaboration with uh friends of the san juans partnered with five other environmental organizations so evergreen islands friends of the earth stand dot earth resources um and the Puget Sound Keeper Alliance, and I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. <laughs> Anyways, um, there was an application from the refinery in Anacortes. It used to be Tesoro, but now it's Marathon. Um, and uh, they made an application to manufacture and export xylene. And this was a brand new product for that refinery to manufacture. And xylene is something that's used in the manufacture of plastics. And their, their plan was to, um, they would require an additional 120 tank vessel transits a year to manufacture this product and to export it. And they would export the product to Asia where it would be used in manufacturing plastics and whatnot. And um, so uh, we um, went through the whole environmental review process, submitting comments all along the way, going to testify. And, um, and then when it came down to it, we appealed the decision that the hearing examiner made to, to approve the project. And that went, we kind of went up the chain. And finally, um, it went up to the Superior Court level um, in Thurston County. And, um, and after that decision, there was a negotiated settlement. And the upshot was that the project was canceled. So that was just a huge victory. But it's also yeah. a real important lesson because as, um, 
as we transition away from fossil fuels and the demand for traditional fossil fuels goes down, um, the refineries, one option they have is to diversify. And so instead of manufacturing diesel or gasoline or jet fuel or what have you, they can manufacture things like xylene. You know, there's a lot of different petrochemical products that go into manufacturing plastics and all kinds of things. And so that's a likely transition that our local refineries will make. So I'm sure mm. the application we saw um, out of Anacortes to manufacture and export xylene will not be the last. I can imagine that we'll see more of those. And um, yeah, so that's, so, you know. And By the way, just, just as an editorial comment, you know, while everything was focused on air quality and water quality, um, the fact that they were going to be driving giant tanker trucks of caustic chemicals down Route 20, um, you know, any accident and you would have had a major spill and a major disaster that way. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it extends beyond the, the immediacy right. of the production. Yes, absolutely, Glenn. Yeah, I mean, we were very focused on the vessel traffic, but you're right, they would have brought in chemicals for the manufacture of xylene by truck. Yep. So, um, so we are currently um, involved in litigation. Um, we appealed a mitigated determination of non-significance that Whatcom County issued to the Phillips 66 refinery for an expansion project. And the, we went before the hearing examiner. We have an awesome staff attorney, Jenny Barcelo. She just did a great job. And we had some fabulous expert witnesses who um, provided fabulous testimony on the impacts of the project to Southern resident killer whales. We were really fortunate in the, in the expert witnesses who participated. Um, and the result, the hearing examiner decision, we didn't technically win, but the hearing examiner amended the mitigated determination of non-significance in a way that we were really happy with the outcome. But then Philip 66 appealed that decision and named Friends of the San Juans and Whatcom County as respondents. So that's been a very interesting process because now we're working hand in hand with Whatcom County as respondents in this current um, appeal. And we're still waiting for the judge's decision. So we don't know the outcome of that yet, but um, that was, um, it was another situation of just monitoring the different permitting that's going on in the region and engaging where we can. And we made the decision. It was a very, we had a very short notice to make a decision and we just, the organization just decided to go ahead and do the appeal on our own. And uh, I'm so grateful that we were able to do that. And, and, uh, and we've even been able to get some funding from the uh, Northwest Fund for the Environment to do the work, which is great too, so. Do we have a sense of what, like the, the timing of the next steps on that when we might hear back? Um, well, so um, because of COVID, where before there used to be a certain time frame that judges would need to issue a decision, that's all been relaxed. So, um, um, yeah, so we, we don't know when we'll get the decision. We're expecting okay. it soon, but there's no deadline. Basically. Yeah, thanks. So Lovell, I have a, a question from Peter Cavanaugh. Said he would like to get an update from you on the Trans Mountain Pipeline construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, you know, I don't know if any of you remember, but last year, I think it was in August, we sent out a constant contact action alert asking people to contact the insurance company Zurich and ask them to not continue to provide coverage to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And lo and behold, they decided to drop that coverage. That's which amazing. Is just amazing, I, just incredible. And so um, that has been one, um, you know, tactic that environmental groups and tribes and First Nations have used to try to stop the project is to come at it from, from that perspective. Um, at this point, um, it's, you know, it's under construction, it's moving forward. I think there are still, um, 
there's still potential that it won't go through. There have been tremendous cost overruns. Um, and, you know, the costs now are all borne by the Canadian taxpayers because Canada owns the project now. They bought it from, um, uh, from Kinder Morgan. And uh, mm -hmm. so they're saddled with all those additional costs. And compounding that is that um, there just isn't the demand for the product. I mean, especially now with COVID, you know, um, yeah. refinery productivity has just fallen off a cliff. Um, and demand for all the products that they would normally be, be, be selling has just gone down, down, down. So I, I, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but at this point it's moving forward. Hmm. Oh, Peter, if you unmute yourself. Hmm. No. Yes, I'm not. Not known for being mute usually. Uh, thank you. Um, so there has been a pause in tanker traffic with COVID, hasn't there? There's uh, been a slowdown, I understand. There has. Um, you know, initially there was um, there was a challenge even here in the Salish Sea with um, the glut of of either crude oil coming in, not having a place to unload it, or a product that's been manufactured, not having a buyer to send it to. And so there was this issue of what they call overwater storage, where ships were just at anchor, you know, holding the product in the interim. The ships. But, but fortunately, um, we, we um, well, there's just been a change of command, but our former captain of the port, uh, Captain Linda Sturgis, she upheld um, standards of care that dictate how anchorages can be used and was really clear that she was not going to tolerate overwater storage of crude or refined product. And That's the port of Vancouver, is it? No, this is this would be like at Anchorage is near Vendovi in in Washington State. In Washington State, okay. Yeah, no. So this, yeah, she's she's just the U.S. coast. She was the U.S. Coast Guard, and now we have a new captain of the port, Captain Hilbert. Who I I, I mean, this literally just happened a week or so ago. They changed command, so a new captain to get to know. But um, that was a problem initially. But I think that in the meantime, the refineries have adjusted to the current demand and. And so there isn't, um, you know, these, uh, well, I think the overwater storage issue has calmed down somewhat, but. Um, yeah, back, back in May when we were desperately trying to get home from Mexico, um, we saw, you know, in, in LA, Long Beach, tons of these ships just parked out there, you yeah. know, and I said, what is that? What yeah. are they doing? Yeah. And I guess that's what they were doing. They were the storage tanks. Yeah, yeah. So Lovell, the, the economic argument has always been against further development of the tar sands, and it would seem that it's even more so now with reduced demand. Is there any signs that that pressure is having an impact on the Canadian government's support of the project or uh, the uh, sort of general support of the Canadian citizen for the project? You know, I, I think that support of the project has gone down. And I think that as they, as they reconcile their budget based on the economic downturn, it'll become even more of an issue. Um, but it hasn't gotten to the point where, I mean, one of the challenges is it's, it's been approved. So it's in the construction phase at this point. Right. And it's, it's hard to turn, turn it around at this point, I think. Um, but uh, maybe the political will will be there to do that. Yeah. Uh, one economist that I follow, uh, Robin Allen, um, and I can send a link. She does great. I mean, she's just been tracking this project for years. She does great analysis. And um, I'll send a, li a link to Michelle she can share with you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Glenn, go ahead. I've got one kind of from left field here. The, yeah. um, you know, the creation of the National Monument, one of the, the issues or one of the goals was to do a one-stop shop uh, for everything going on in the San Juan Islands. 
you know, and that includes research and that includes, you know, well, we're talking federal, state, local, you know, academia, private, et cetera. That kind of died on the vine as far as I can see. And, yeah. and it seems like there's really a lot of goodness in being able to, you know, kind of collaborate and pull together everything that's going on out here. Is anybody that you know of doing anything like that? You know, when I remember when we were working on that, when, when the monument was first established and it really had a lot of promise, but I am not aware of that moving forward. And I think um, there's even challenges just completing the process of, of establishing the management plan. I don't think that's been finalized yet, as far as I've heard. Does mm -hmm. anybody else know any more up-to-date information about that? Oh. But just that, that is a... Uh, you know, like a required uh, step, and it's 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 been challenged so or challenging. So, um, but I think well, we kind of know who the stakeholders are, right? I mean, you know, so maybe somebody steps right up and you know tries to take charge of the whole thing. Yeah, I I would imagine that that uh, that will move forward again because there there really is so much potential there and it was there was a lot of buy-in to, to making that happen so i would imagine that that would get picked up again but i but i can think i can imagine that definitely all the people working in you know that are working on the national monument um the blm staff and and the folks working on that that their job one is to get that management plan done so that's their focus now Okay, I do have another question. I've got one that's come in, Lovell. Um, this may be a screen share kind of question for you. It says, what do we know about ship routing through the Salish Sea and where the biggest risks are? Yeah, um, so I think that, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead because this is a question I got in advance. And so what I gave to Michelle are a couple of slides from, there was a study done in 2015, the Vessel Traffic Risk Assessment. And, um, and they analyzed um, all the vessel traffic, the actual vessel traffic from 2015. And they did an analysis of all the risks of accidents. And then from those accidents, the risks of oil spills, and um, this is a three-dimensional map. And I just want to orient you because it's not obvious how to read it. The blue is the water. And so Michelle's cursor is coming in on the Strait of Juan de Fuca there and going up. And once you put a circle around the San Juan Islands. Yeah, OK. So can everybody see what we're looking at there? Mm -hmm. so in two, the vessel traffic in 2015, the greatest risk by volume of oil spills was in Rosario Strait and the connected waterways east. So um, Saddlebag and you know going over towards Guamus and Vendovi and Jack Island and the Padilla Bay. Um, and so that, so you can see those big spikes there. That's where the, the risk was in 2015. And they also, you can go forward, Michelle, to the next slide. So they modeled all the projected um, vessel oh, traffic from all the projects that were either under construction or in the application process. And so this slide shows what, where the risk is when you add all those ves the vessel traffic uh, to mm. the model. And you can see that there's still a lot of oil spill risk in the Rosario Strait and the connected waterways east, but then you look at all the increase in risk in Harrow Strait and Boundary Pass. Ooh. So, um, and that's mainly because the majority of the projects that are still to this day um, coming online or projected to come online are projects up in Canada. So that's all vessel traffic that would travel through Harrow Strait and Boundary Pass. So, um, so, and I think that uh, you know, Rosario Strait has its own issues and that it's a very narrow waterway. And so there's regulations in place that um, large tankers um, only move through Rosario in one direction at a time. So not that it's all, it's not like a one-way street where it's always northbound or always southbound. It's just that 
they don't allow those big ships to cross paths with each other in Rosario Strait to avoid the possibility of a collision. Um, well, now, the, the VTS, the vessel tracking system, is still advisory, not directorial, right? So this is correct. So, um, so we have a, what we have, a, we have what we call a cooperative vessel traffic service where all of the Strait of Juan de Fuca is overseen by the U.S. Coast Guard's vessel traffic service, both sides of the border. And then all of Harrow Strait and Boundary Pass and Lower Georgia Strait, both sides of the border, are managed by Canadian vessel traffic service. And um, they're, you know, the vessel traffic service, they, um, you know, the captain of the ship is still the captain of the ship and they make their own mistakes, but there's consequences if they don't do what they're told to do or if they aren't following the regulations, they're not staying in their appropriate lane. Um, they don't make good passing arrangements with another ship or what have you. Um, but, um, and, and I, from what I hear, the way Canada and the US manages our waterways, it's seamless for the mariners. Mm -hmm. What we really need to do more of, and, and something I've been working on through the Puget Sound Harbor Safety Committee is to, um, I really think that what happens in the US is really a model um, in the, the Puget Sound Harbor Safety Committee is very proactive. When they see a pattern of incidents taking place, they make adjustments and they make changes so that there's never an accident that happens. And in Canada, they don't have quite as an inclusive and as quite as proactive a process from my perspective. So I think there's more we can do to collaborate across the border in terms of the proactive waterway management. But in terms of how it works for if you're a captain of a ship and you're trying to get from point A to point B, you might not even notice that you're being handed off from the U.S. to Canada at a certain place or vice versa. So, and then I just, in terms of risk in our waterways, um, you know, Harrow Strait and Boundary Pass has a, a very significant turn at turn point. And, and that's a real challenge. Um, and it's an area of concern such that they established uh, a special operating area there <clears throat> because, um, because of the turn and because of the lack of visibility that ships might have uh, with each other as they approach the turn. So they have some special protocols in place so ships don't meet each other at that point. And, um, uh, but that's, I, I think that's, you know, that's the biggest concern is for ships that are transiting that waterway, you know, if they should lose power, heaven forbid, you know, it's, it wouldn't take long for them to go aground. So that's, that's a concerning area. All right, how about another question? Emily, do you have any comments or questions? Somebody's on mute. I'm on mute. Yeah. We can hear you now. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I just wanted to listen. I just was curious as to what the kind of an update on what the status is of the Salish Sea and what are the hot the hot topics. Um, yeah. What do you think the most important thing going forward to uh, for us to be on the to be knowledgeable of about? So. Um, one project that's that I think is that really deserves our attention um, just across the border, actually less than a mile from Washington State, the Port of Vancouver has proposed a project called Roberts Bank Terminal 2. And it would be the construction of a new container ship terminal that would generate up to 520 additional container ship transits a year. And they would literally build it, you know, right there in um, in, you know, like in this prime habitat for southern resident killer whales, the Fraser River salmon, um, and then there's all the associated um, impacts and risks from the additional vessel traffic. Um, there's a lot of concern about tankers that are transporting oil because of the cargo, um, but typically those ships are, um, have tug escorts, so there's a lot of redundancy to prevent an accident from happening. 
but these huge container ships that carry millions of gallons of propulsion fuel aren't required to have tug escorts. So, um, you know, it, it's real concerning the potential for accidents from both container ships and what's called bulkers, you know, these ships that carry product in bulk, um, which typically are older ships and, um, you know, foreign flag, maybe ships that aren't in the best of condition. Those are, those are the ships that are of real concern in terms of uh, oil spill from their propulsion fuel. So um, we're actually there. If you were up in Canada right now in British Columbia, you would know all about Roberts Bank Terminal 2. Um, our colleagues up in Canada are doing a great job opposing the project, trying to keep that project from getting its final permit. And so we're going to take up that uh, rallying cry here in Washington State. Um, I, um, I drafted a letter to Governor Inslee asking Governor Inslee to oppose the project on our behalf. And uh, right now it's getting sign-ons from other organizations. And next Thursday we'll do some outreach with the public, asking the public to also be engaged and reach out to Governor Inslee, but also to the, um, the ministers and the prime minister in Canada who are making the final permitting decision for that project. So who, who assumes the liability there? Is it the shipping company or is it the port? So typically the ships are all separately owned. They're like their own LLC. So once the ship leaves the dock, it's, if there's an accident, it's all, it's all on the ship. Um, while it's at the dock, if there's some sort of accident that takes place at the dock, then there's, then there's the, the responsibility is with the, the, uh, the terminal. Um, but one of the, there was an environmental review process that went on for years. We submitted, we started submitting comment letters on this project, I think in 2015, might have even been 2014. And last year, we actually went up to Canada and testified before the um, federal review panel, and which was a real experience because um, the Port of Vancouver, they had like 30 people in suits, all these different experts, you know, so that if any little question is asked, they had an eelgrass expert, they had a forage fish expert, you know, they had, and they're just like, they're packing the room and, and then there's, you know, me and Stephanie there to testify, <laughs> and uh, but we it was great, and uh, we did our best. But um, it is a challenge engaging the permitting in Canada because they don't really have any obligation to uh, address issues impacts to U.S. Um, but um, anyways, uh, the, that review panel though did determine that there would be adverse and cumulative effects to the southern resident killer whales. Um, so it, it'll be, um, and, and they recognize that, that it's beyond mitigation, that there, it's a very low probability, but an extremely high consequence if there's a ship strike, for example. And then also if there's an oil spill, that could be devastating to the population. And that was one of the reasons why they were listed in the first place was because they recognized that, um, you know, Washington State, we have our five refineries and we have a lot of vessel traffic, tanker traffic, uh, oil transport here. We're actually the fifth largest refining state in the nation. And they, and they recognized that one of the threats to the Southern residents was a spill. And if there was an oil spill in the vicinity of, of the Southern residents, because they stay together in groups, they could all be impacted by that one spill. Um, there was a a pod of southern residents in Alaska at the time of the Exxon Valdez spill, and they are functionally extinct. There's a few members of that family left, but they're not reproducing, and when the last members of that family die, they'll be gone. Um, so uh, that the oil spill risk is, is a real threat to the southern residents. Um, anyway, so be watching for that um, outreach, and hopefully you can reach out and put in your two cents and uh, try to try to raise awareness here in Washington State too. We have I have a quick question about that if it's okay. You know, I, um, I absolutely get it in terms of the potential in impacts on the Southern residents. Um, like when you went up and testified and, and in the um, 
you know, the work that's being done right now to build opposition to this, is a lot of the focus on the Southern residents um, or is there also conversation about, you know, I mean, cause it would wreck the whole ecosystem, right? It's not just them. Um, it is, you know, in your experience, you know, which is, which is the, the, the part of that, that, you know, kind of sells the most, is it, is it save the orcas or, or is it, you know, ecosystem collapse and, you know, plus the economic disaster that would come with that. Yeah, um, you know, one of the huge impacts from Roberts Bank Terminal 2 was the physical location that terminal would be built and the importance of that ecosystem for the birds that migrate, you know, between, and, and actually, Peter, you can answer this better than I can, but that um, area is a stopover for birds that go between the Arctic and, you know, where, uh, wherever in the Southern Hemisphere, yeah. and it's, it's critical for them. Um, and the physical footprint, just that in and of itself, forget about all the shipping traffic and oil spill risk and all of that, just that physical footprint is really going to Im impact the habitat there for, for the migratory birds. And yeah, that's, it's a refueling station, isn't it, for them? Yes. Yeah, I think the entire world's population of sandpiper, they all go there when they're traveling back and forth on their migratory route. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think that, um, you know, one of the reasons that we focus on the southern resident orca is, is because of our long histories of that population and our work to help protect and recover them. But we also recognize that, you know, everything that we do for them benefits the Salish Sea. You know, so to the extent that we can help with their food web, you know, we're protecting natural beaches, we're protecting the forage fish population and the salmon. So it's all interconnected. But I think that, <clears throat> I think that the southern residents are a species that we can identify with. And, um, and we can, you know, empathize with the plight that they're facing and the, and, and just the, the fact of their, um, the status of the population, the critical juncture they're at, um, I think we can, you know, empathize with that and it, and it motivates us maybe more than it would uh, for, you know, a sandpiper. I mean, I, I, it depends on the person, right? But right. it's all interconnected. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a marine ecosystem. It's all related. So right. can anybody explain why the northern residents, the Canadian northern residents are doing better than the southern residents? What is Canada doing that keeps them in food, they eat the same thing, Chinook. And, um, you know, why are they doing so much better? I don't know if you have an answer to that, but I'm curious. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for that. It's, um, I mean, part of it is just their, their habitat and they do stay separate. They don't interbreed. Um, and, um, but that's, that's a really good question and I don't have a good answer for you, but I'll find out. Thank you. <laughs> but, but, you know, I guess this is where maybe I would kind of venture away from, you know, the Southern residents as the, the centerpiece of the whole thing. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of habitat issues. You know, we're saying that the Southern residents are not doing well, at least in a large part due to the lack of salmon. Well, the lack of salmon is due to a lot of things. I mean, it's warming, it's lack of, you know, habitat, it's, you know, other things going after forage fish. It's, you know, it's, there's a litany of these things that all of these other projects could have a serious impact on that, that are much broader and as if not more impactful than the direct impact on the Southern residents. You know, and that, that troubles me a lot. You know, in the governor's task force, the whole issue of runoff, um, you know, from agriculture and that sort of thing like that, and the, the, the impact that that was having, that was lost in the noise. And, you know, and I mean, I, I think, while it, it certainly is a rallying cry and you can build banners and you can get people behind you quickly, I think, you know, maybe a broader kind of thought process around what the, the, the future thrust ought to be, it's gotta be probably a little broader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that there's so much more that needs to happen. 
And, um, and you touched on a really important issue, which is that the regulations with regard to agriculture are really lax. And that is a huge source of pollutant that goes into the marine waters and the fresh waters that the, that the fish depend on. That's so what killed the Chesapeake. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a huge issue. I think the, the, um, the one issue in terms of focusing on that, on the vessel is that while the bigger, longer, deeper issue of prey availability is so critical, it's also really critical that the, the orca can catch the scarce prey that are there now. So to the extent that we can deal with those immediate uh, changes to vessel noise and help improve their ability to feed on what's there, which is too little, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's an important step there. But you're, you're so right that it's, it's the whole big issue for sure. I, th I really think it's just, you know, as far as fundraising and, and what do they call it, sexiness in fundraising are the Southern residents. You know, people relate to them. They feel, you know, protective of them and stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot of organizations that deal with that. Um, and so I, I don't know. The charismatic megafauna. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I yeah, see we're at our, of our world here. <laughs> Sorry, level. Well, I, we're at our six thirty mark, and I want to thank Level. Thank you so much for giving thank us you. this hour. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks for all you do. He does a lot. See what I mean by that mm -hmm. knowledge and passion. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at Friends, we know it's important to monitor these projects and influence decision makers um, to protect the Salish Sea. So we hope that you learned a lot. Um, your support has an impact. This is what puts level into these meetings to be able to talk to decision makers to to track all of this. Um, she's got a, an incredible depth of knowledge as we've seen her answering these, you know, quick questions, which I know she could talk a lot longer on. Um, and this is what just enables our work. It, it's protecting the Salish Sea and our islands. So I hope that you'll become a member and make a donation. Um, you can go online or do the text if I can get the screen up here quickly. Um, <laughs> We have a, a $500 match tonight again, so help us to leverage that. And here is no that. wrong oh. one, wrong one. Yeah, the, <laughs> wrong one, wrong one. <laughs> but I love this one. You know, level gives this to me, and I just would toggle back and forth between this. That's huge. That's that's a big. Um, big difference oh, actually wow. to watch that. So I'm going to see if I can get to my other. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to get back to my original screen. So I'm just going to say, if you'd like to text, the number is 360-317-2610. And it's super, super, just a couple little clicks with your finger on your phone. Um, OK. Thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. And have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. You guys, Thank too. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>